Welcome your next performer, Melissa Mendez. It's a Friday night, the only day of the week where all four family members are present for dinner. We sit around the table and discuss how our day was and tell funny experiences we had with people through the day. But for some reason, even with all this joyfulness, the family discussion always ends up silent when any one of us gets reminded of the sad reality that is our lives. For the majority of people, a walk around the block or a quick car ride to the market up the street doesn't cause tension or fear. But being the oblivious humans we are, we don't realize that for a lot of people, those daily activities are more than nerve wracking because we don't know what's going to happen and we have to be prepared for the unexpected. I am a first generation American, along with my brother. We come from immigrant parents who came here like many others for better opportunities. The both of them worked very hard and sacrificed many things to be able to have a home for our prospering family. Picture a beautiful, comfortable, and safe small little blue house in a diverse neighborhood with constant sirens and engines roaring as they go way past the speed limit, racing to God knows what. My father immigrated to, from his country to Central America when he was 18. It was nothing but bumps in the road for him since things, aren't, since things are more than tough for an immigrant in the United States. In his journey of seeking a better life for his struggling family back in Central America, he met a woman who practically swept him off his feet. My mom is from Mexico and immigrated here with her family when she was very young. Both my mother and my dad have one aspiring goal, to achieve the American dream, more specifically to ensure stability and a clear path to college for their kids. My dad never stopped worrying about providing stability for his family back in his country, and soon his goal of seeking a better life for them started becoming a reality. Soon after, soon after some of his brothers and sisters had even come to the US, all including my Uncle Max. My Uncle Max was funny and had a charismatic visage and personality. If you can picture a short and chubby man in his early 30s with brown curly hair, then you've got a clear image of my Theo Max. Any and every time he'd visit us from San Francisco, he would always have a new story to tell, new journeys that had me on the edge of my seat, eager to hear more. Like the time when he would tell us about his dreamlike ranch, where he would have tons of cattle and different types of animals. As a kid who was intrigued by anything animal-like, I would always enjoy picturing his future ranch. He would continue to tell about being a, an assistant butcher, bragging about how much enthusiasm he had at the age of 12 when he was already amazing at butchering cattle. In exchange for his work, instead of getting paid in money, the butcher would pay him in pounds of meat so he could bring food home for his family. Just like these stories portray him as a joyful man he was, it also shows how he could manifest entertainment in our household, especially when he would bring his favorite sparkler fireworks. As a kid, being afraid of anything that explodes, I could never bring myself to join the fun. Instead, I would stay inside and watch from a distance. Occasionally, we'd meet eyes, and he'd motion me to come outside, saying, Vente, Melissa. But being the little girl who enjoyed playing with her dolls in the living room, I preferred being inside. At times, I would peek my head over the bar of the window, only to imagine how holding one of those sparklers in my hand would be like, as a skinny stick would illuminate my face, showing the priceless amount of happiness on it. Not long after that, my uncle became very sick and was diagnosed with leukemia. I was nine and didn't know how bad cancer could get or how bad it was. To me, it was just like he had the flu, but I had no clue those fireworks would be the last memory I had of him. When my uncle was diagnosed, he was placed in the hospital in San Francisco. At the time, doctors were already starting his chemotherapy and it seemed that there was still a great amount of hope for his recovery to continue on with a normal life, which he so much desired to have again. Being in the hospital, his immigration status brought the immigration authorities to question his citizenship. The doctors had released my uncle and gave him new scheduled dates to come back for further chemotherapy. Unfortunately, those scheduled dates were never fulfilled. My uncle was finally able to see himself living stably with a normal life when immigration officers came and deported him to his native land. When a person gets deported, there is an immigration agent who ex escorts you and takes you through the process of deportation at the airport. My uncle and his family were already having financial issues. As if keeping up with the expensive medical bills wasn't enough, they made my uncle
They made my uncle buy his own one-way ticket to his native land and made him go voluntarily. Once in his country, he found out that it was more reasonable for him to be in Tijuana, with family that would give him a better opportunity to continue his treatment. Already being terribly sick, he still had to travel two weeks by bus to be in Tijuana with some family. Imagine three weeks having cancer and not having the right treatment to keep you alive. That was exactly what my uncle had to endure. Once in TJ, my family didn't have enough money to place him in a hospital. So they placed him in a clinic, which was limited in medical supplies, just as they were limited in medical staff. My aunt had offered my brother a chance to go with her to TJ to visit my uncle. And being only a child wanting to follow my brother everywhere, I wanted to join him to see our uncle. I wanted to see him, but being only nine, my parents didn't think it was such a great idea. So me and my brother had to stay behind. My uncle had grown on me to the point where I couldn't handle the fact that my parents weren't allowing me to see my uncle in Tijuana. Pero mami, yo quería ir. I continued saying this until we got home. In exhaustion from throwing my tantrum, I took a nap and everything was forgotten and everything seemed fine. Until I woke up the next day and I got a call. Tu tío Max ha fallecido. Your Uncle Max has passed on is what my dad told our devastated family. But this goes farther than just a deadly disease. This goes all the way to the inhumanity of the immigration system. My uncle had grown in me, and although we didn't have his presence anymore, it's like a piece of him was still around in my family. I was nine then and didn't see the bigger picture of what had really happened. Now I'm 15 and it's starting to become more than clear to me how unfair this country can be towards immigrants, even if it was built off the statement, freedom and justice for all. This was the one incident that was able to change the atmosphere of my house in almost an instant. For me, being a first generation American who copes with similar struggles as her parents, it's more than clear how racism still exists and how even after so much time, immigrants are starting to face even harsher conditions than before and are being treated like cruel criminals, even if the only thing most of them are guilty of is the urge of seeking a better future for themselves and their family. All the sacrifices and discrimination my parents have had to cope with over the years is a constant reminder to me and my brother that every day we have to work harder than ever to try to reach our highest potential. Manténganse enfocados y creen en la educación is what my father, father constantly reminds us, which means keep yourself focused and believe in education. For my parents, it's always been their main priority to keep us in school and demand that we get a better than average grades so that one day we could attend a four-year university and prove that we are more than capable of doing just that, not only to ourselves, but also to the people who don't think we can because of our ethnic background. Even in this melting pot of diverse and ethnic backgrounds, for some people, it's more than difficult to get over racism and intolerance of new practices and new cultures. This is why my mom constantly reminds us to forgive, but to never forget. Porque si te olvidas de lo que te hicieron, vas a ser más inclinada que te lo hagan otra vez. Because if you forget, then you're more inclined to be hurt again. Just like my family tries to forgive the rude looks, trash talk directed to people like us on pol politic shows on the news, and the constant reminder that we aren't welcomed here by some. But we never forget what they've said, because then we would be walking around like nothing's wrong, ignoring the problem instead of standing up and fighting for our rights. Yeah, sure, you may see me as an average teenager, but I know that I am and will forever be an American girl with Latin American roots. Una niña americana con raíces latinas. Thank you. Melissa Mendez!